Okay, I'm here in the Loon Gallery with uh, Stephanie. Or is it Steph? <laughs> Whichever. Uh, Mel French, Between a Rock and a Hard Place, written on the wall. Okay, so that's the beginning. Uh, this is Mel's first exhibition to be showcased. I like that. I like trees inside the buildings. Because I, I, I've got this thing in my head, like that the you know, trees were here before the buildings. And that looks like a baby hanging upside down from the tree. What, what's the baby made of? The baby is made of... It's a wax baby. Wax. As you can see. Wow. But it was made with... Uh, it was first modelled in clay from the images of the artist's friend's newborn baby. And then a mould was made from using the clay uh, model. And then it was cast in wax from the mould. And as you can see, the speckled effect, it was kind of put out together and... It was continuously, you know, kind of little flecks built up yeah. to make the model. And like little wafers of, of, of wax. Basically that. And uh, I'm just kind of wondering what it says to me, like to see a baby. Almost, the baby looks as if it's falling out of the tree. Uh, and you kind of wonder what a baby was doing up there in the first <laughs> place. Well, that's the question we want the, the viewer to see. We want the, like the, your first impression of seeing this baby. As you can see, it's not the most cutest looking baby that no. you'd see. <laughs> it almost seems as if it fell from the sky and, and got caught up in the tree. But um, there's a bit more to this uh, tree. This tree is actually was originally in Mel's garden. And like she watched it and she put the baby in like the tree uh, for while it was there. And a load of birds started to build their nests around the baby in the tree which she thought was really remarkable and she saw it like uh, over time she saw the birds grow up and build their families and the little uh, fledglings fly off eventually and then uh, over time it died the tree died and the birds had left the nests or had left the tree so she wanted to kind of keep the tree and preserve it so she brought it inside and stripped it of the bark yeah and quite dry and stripped it down and and uh, obviously the baby had gathered attention with the wildlife and she kind of has it on show to question the viewer would you like save a creature in need if you saw it in need well i suppose it's very uh, topical now with the refugee crisis from syria and and that image during the week of a little baby face down in the on the beach in turkey um and, and that's what a kind of get your attention you almost feel like you need to hold out your hands to catch the baby to prevent it from falling from the tree definitely and just by the way the baby is naked as well you kind of be worried is it cold is it you yeah. know exposed to the elements okay okay so that's that one we'll go to next so immediately you're struck by two figures look to be grappling on the on the ground they're fighting they're obviously fighting uh one is one is female one is is it two females two females it looks very unusual because it's not the kind of thing you'd expect females to, to be physically aggressive. And then the other thing is that they have no hair, so in a way, they're, they're, it, it takes away from their character, their, their personality. And there's, a, there's, a, there's an absolute look of anguish on one face because the fingers are pushed, fingers of, of one person is pushed into the face of the other person. And then they, this particular person has fingers pushed into her skull. And she's trying to suck on the nipple of, of that one. So, I mean, it's difficult to imagine what this suggests. It's almost like one person is reluctantly allowing the other to breastfeed. That's a correct assumption. Like A very good observation you've made there. It's called permeo, which means penetrate or pass through. And it uses breastfeeding as a metaphor to describe give and take between humans and to describe the notion of... What is too much? Yeah, and, and they're both obviously uh, adults as well. Probably not too young looking either. I mean, just if you, you kind of look at the, the state of the feet, they look like a, kind of an older person's feet. So it's, it's not as if you were nourishing a baby. Yeah? So it's give and take between human beings. So it's fascinating. It's interesting. Well, it's open to interpretation. Like, you know, they're not any person in particular. Like, all of us have our own inner demons that we want to get rid of and want to kind of prov like stop the taking advantage of other people. Okay. Um, okay. So this next one, it looks like a collection of heads on the ground, and they're all looking up to a 
blanket looks as if it's, it's suspended over the, the top but it's almost as if they're it's like people who are they look to be drowning you know they look to be choking the way that the tongue is out of the mouth it looks as if they're they can't get enough air in and even some of the other faces I haven't got as much detail. They seem to be almost as if they're deeper in. So I, I would imagine that these are people who seem to be trying to, to, to live, trying to, I mean, even the expressions on their foreheads, they're very wrinkled. And it's as if they need to get up there to the, to the blanket. That looks very much like a baby's blanket to me. So it's probably got to do with the cycle of, of birth and death. Certainly that's what I would see in it. It's a close enough observation there, I, I can tell you. That blanket was originally Mel's husband's christening blanket. Ah, and it's used to decipher uh, the sort of the parent figure in a person's life. And all of the heads down here, with their mouths gaped open, are depictions of when you see a bird, like a nest of birds waiting to be fed. Yeah. By their and their beaks open. Their beaks for open. The food. And they're waiting for the parents to come and feed them. And it's kind of where um, El gets into the whole psyche of the adult child who's still being parented or mothered by their parent and they're still dependent on their parent. Yeah, because they look very much to be adult heads but in a way like, like little birds uh, to have their eyes closed as if you know, they're totally dependent on what comes from above. OK, we go on to uh, the next piece. I find this disturbing um, because it's, it's two children's chairs, very much old-fashioned chairs, um, there's woodworm in one of them. Uh, they're both shades of blue. One is a kind of a baby blue and the other is a uh, royal blue. So they're not in the best of condition. But there looks to be what, what it looks to be a fetus. But it looks to be a fetus of a, of a child. One on the baby blue one and two on the other one. But it also reminds you of birds in the nest. They're in their bodies. They're, again, they're totally dependent on somebody else to look after them. So it looks as if it's the body of a bird and the head of a human. So is it the same kind of thing, dependency on somebody else? Well, this piece is called Hatchling 1 and 2. There was originally three pieces to it. The piece was inspired by the artist from hatchlings that had fallen from a nest. And unfortunately, the hatchlings hadn't survived. They had died. And she could see the parents overhead flying around, crying out for their babies, even though the babies had died. But the babies in this piece are alive. And as you can see, their mouths are open. So it's kind of it's similar to Wien, where it's the babies waiting to be fed. And them sitting on the feeding chair is where she gets the, the idea, you know, your baby's sitting in their feeding chair waiting mm-hmm. to be fed. Yeah. And, and this particular one we're looking at, the baby isn't actually sitting in the seat of the chair. The baby's on the table of the chair. Uh, this work references the utter dependence that infants have on their parents. When you see a newborn and the way their heads are all floppy, you know, they have to be kind of held gently and carefully to stabilise, well, not stabilise them, but... Yeah, support like them. Support and, them and, and, and nourish them. OK, should we move along? OK, again, this one looks like a head just on a shelf lying as if it's asleep. And it looks to be made of wax because it, it seems to be almost like a Salvador Dali piece. It's, it's um, spilled over the edge and it's solidified. But it very much looks like somebody who's, who's asleep. Even the mouth is open. Uh, certainly that's the way I sleep. I don't breathe through my nose. I have my mouth open. I don't drool like Homer Simpson. But um, the person looks to be just asleep. I wouldn't associate this with, with death. I don't think it's just sleeping. Certainly that's what I get from it. It's an excellent observation, Paul, because the person is, in fact, sleeping. This part is called fleeting, where it uh, features a sleeping head and looks at the vulnerability and peace one experiences when asleep. Yeah, and, and I would say actually the, the absolute freedom somebody can experience while it's asleep as well, because um, certainly with my interest in dreaming and dream interpretation, uh, I would see sleep as a, even as a form of escapism, which is interesting. And I think, you know, with, with some of the other pieces, um, even debt to, in some societies or some religions even is, is seen as a kind of an escape, and the, the ultimate escaping uh, and going on to something else. Okay, is there anything else? Oh, so that is true. Yes, <laughs> but that was in fact a happy accident. It wasn't intentional, but then when the artist looked back on it, it you know she realised it did have a purpose. The drool represents time passing by, and that it's ever you know continuing. Yeah, and it's it's like it's it's solidified. It's almost like um, stalactite or stalagmite, the way it might drip from the ceiling of a cave, and it'll solidify on the bottom. Very good.
there's actually one right when you come in the door. Yeah, yeah. That piece is quite interesting. This looks like a, a man. It's it's the, the a bust of a man. Is his head and his shoulders, and he looks to be screaming. It's almost like you know, in a way, it looks a bit like Paul O'Connell because it's it's bald head and it's imagine it's like you see Paul O'Connell, you know, trying to motivate the, the troops on a on a field, on a on a rugby field, but he seems to be not so much angry, but but almost a kind of like desperation that he needs to get his message in and he needs to kind of interject and interrupt something. So, well, that's the name of the piece here. It's actually called Interjection. Oh, okay. And it's capturing an emotion frozen, frozen in time. It looks at someone experiencing great anguish or pain. Uh, and as you described there, the, pa- the face is clearly... Yeah, you can see the, the, the sinews in the neck, the muscles in the neck are raised as well. Okay. This, is, sorry, this has another look at psychological conditions. Anger, rage and screaming are often symbols of dementia, hysteria or intermittent explosive disorder, anxiety, both bipolar disorder, chemical dependencies and psychotic conditions. Okay, very good. So, uh, where are next? Inside here. We have a few more. <laughs> oh, okay. Looks a bit like uh, dog hair in a... Uh, not a, va- a vase. What, what would you call that? Kind of Belgium. Belgium, yes. It looks like uh, hair... Bristle or or whatever, I don't. And it's kind of it's gone around in a, in a circle, almost like it was like, like a candle holder or something. So, I don't know. Uh, to me, I would say like preservation because I know hair is one of the last things to to disintegrate. Hair can be preserved for for hundreds of years, and if you kind of put something under a jar, you don't want it kind of exposed to the outside. Very close there with your observation. <laughs> the little pieces of hair that you see are actually nests of hair. Nests of hair, right? And okay. the hair is an important kind of factor in the artist's work because it's from her two children, her two oh. boys, okay. uh, for each piece. Interesting. And the nest is seen as a place where you're secure, you're safe. A place of refuge. It, it's yeah. your home. Yeah. Uh, and it's like going back to the animal zoomorphism which um, uh, you describe an, a nest is a bird's home it's where they're safe yet at the same time it's delicate and fragile yep. so the bell jar is used as the sort of protection that protects the home okay interesting so we're going to this next piece and it looks like a looks like a woman who is projectile vomited out on the floor the piece on the floor looks like looks like a very fat lady uh, naked on the floor, uh, no arms. So again, that symbol of almost helplessness, being being dependent. So it's probably about birth, even though it's it's projected out of, out of the mouth. But it's kind of like out of one human being comes another human being, and it's interesting because the human being on the floor almost looks older than the human being that's on the platform. So it's kind of like a reversal of roles. So am I right with the vomiting? You're very right with the vomiting. Uh, this was actually Mel's uh, college piece, her master's piece in college in the New York Academy of Art, and it won the Prince of Wales uh, Fellowship for her. I can see why. It's very interesting. This piece is called Relative Distance, and it's about purging oneself of negative behaviours, feelings or actions in order to move on. Why so that? the person on the floor depicts pe- the like her negative like personality that she might have had she's trying to get rid of it it could be an addiction like smoking or it drinking it could even be some a self image self concept because sometimes we kind of see ourselves very negatively like we're, we're fat or we're not you know we're bold or we're, we're not good enough so certainly the, the figure on the on the floor looks to be um uh, well ugly for want of, want of a better <laughs> um adjective so we, we move on down here it's very interesting it say seems like a black woman with a, a dog head and there's a bowl of black liquid and then oh, it's called black dog <laughs> and it's plaster of pigment and steel nylon and enamel and over it there are tuning forks suspended okay so what would i make of of this i'm not quite sure i mean it doesn't it looks like almost um black it depends on on what black means here black can be negativity it can also be kind of private it, it because black doesn't reflect any light it just seems to absorb light but it again it might be in in getting rid of the negativity because black can be associated with negativity in the in the bowl i don't get the impression 
well, not necessarily that the dog or the woman in this is going to necessarily drink from the bowl, but again, maybe putting the substance in the bowl. And the tuning forks have got to do with music and sound and maybe a higher vibration. Yeah. What do you think? Well, to begin with, it was Winston Churchill that popularised the phrase black dog to describe bouts of depression. Ah. And this piece is where it, it, it's looking back at, you know, the black dog of this depression. Hmm. And back in the day, where you see the enamel bowl, that yep. was used by doctors. Uh, so there's a surgical feel to that. Okay. And the tuning forks were used by doctors to determine mental conditions in patients back in... Well, I don't know if they still use it nowadays. I, I, I would assume that they do. Okay. But as you can hear, not the tuning fork. That okay. wasn't great. <laughs> Try again. And hold it up to a patient's ear okay. to see what their reaction to the tuna fork would be. Hmm. It's interesting that uh, actually today there are um, therapies that employ sound. There's a humming therapy, uh, and then there is also there are sound therapies as well, using um, a person's natural ability to make sound, and then um, musical instruments or objects as well. But the reason the person, like the dog figure, is looking into the bowl is the way when someone is suffering with depression, they yeah. don't look at what's going on around them. Instead, they continue to look into this black bowl, like this black sort of yeah. liquid, and see nothing but darkness. They don't see their own reflection, so their view yeah. is distorted. It's like that. a black hole, whereas really they could look up and see yeah. something a whole lot better. This uh, piece on the floor, then, it's, it's quite small. It's interesting because um, it looks like a, a dog. It looks like a, a female dog, a bitch, lying on the floor, the way a dog would lie if, if the dog was going to feed pups. But although it, it looks to be female, it probably, it probably could actually be, be male either. But again, the, the person that's lying on the floor looks to be, well, not very comfortable. They don't look to be asleep in this case. They look to be almost as if there's, there's pressure on them or they kind of feel this obligation maybe to provide. This part, I hope I pronounce it right, it's mater mattress, which is Latin for mother. And so um, it describes that it, it was modelled on photos of a woman and a Yorkshire Terrier. Okay. And it plays the role in the idea of an act going unnoticed the way when you see a mother animal, they like feed their babies, and like you know, or if you do a, a good deed to someone, or lots of good deeds, they're often overlooked, and you know that that's why the figure is so small in comparison to the rest of all the yeah. other models. It's like the small good deed getting kind of oh, unnoticed, no, taken taken for granted, and the whole expression is that exhausted expression when you see a mother after giving birth they're tired yet yeah. they're happy to have their little newborns around them okay uh, thank you very much steph for the tour thank you